It's working. Boy, everybody's stayed home today. They forgot to, they did not, or they either maybe, maybe they heard the good news. You know what the good news? Next week, next week, snow flurries. <laughs> that doesn't work. My aunt tried that, and she said, I just bit my tongue and bit my tongue, and it still came out. So, snow flurries. It is just about winter time. Oh, isn't that great? No. Did you say snow? Who said snow? Oh, you said no. Yeah, yeah, I know that's what you said, but I don't, I don't care what you said. It's not right. All right. I was, you know, I think we only got about today, and according to how much I get done today and next week, and I believe the Holy Spirit thing will be over. I hope that we've gotten a little bit out of it. I have got a lot out of it. That I think all good things must come to an end. So I think this that we are going to talk a little bit about, uh, I was going to talk about blasphemy because I was asked by some la- somebody that uh, if, she said, I don't speak in tongues because I'm afraid of blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Now, what do we know about the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? We know one thing if we know anything else. It's unpardonable sin. So that's what I set out to talk about. I had books. I began to read, and I was looking and made notes. But then I found something else. Something that really pertains to Christians. Say, why would I say that? Because blasphemy is not done by Christians. Because we believe that the Lord is true. We believe that his miracles are real. And so we don't, we don't accuse him or knock him down or say bad things about him. But we do these things. We resist the Holy Spirit. We grieve the Holy Spirit. And we what the Bible called vex the Holy Spirit. Now, we may not believe that we do. We may not even think about it when we do it, but we do it. So that's what we're going to talk about today. And hopefully if I get through it, but next week probably will be the end of it. So let us stand and let's remember the ones that are sick. Thank you, Jesus. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity that we can come today and open your word and to study. We thank you for this study on the Holy Spirit, and I pray, God, that we all have gotten received something out of it. For we know that without the Holy Spirit, we can do nothing. He is the one who convicts us. He is the one who leads us and guides us. And I pray, God, that you would just take this lesson that we have today and that we can understand, Lord, and and not feel guilty, but understand why we do such things. And Father, I pray for all these ones that are sick, especially the ones that has the, the COVID, Lord. I pray that you would just let your healing hand come down and touch each and every one. Lord, ease the breathing and cause the fever to, to vanish. And Lord, I just pray that you would give him strength. And Lord, we restore the, the strength and take away the tiredness. And I ask, Lord, that you would just minister, not only to people who that, but for others who are sick in body. And Father, for the ones here today who has uh, decisions to make or whatever is in her life, Lord, that you need to be a part of. And I pray that you would just lead and guide. Help us, Lord, to know that the Holy Spirit is there to help us to make good decisions. I ask, Lord, that you would just bless this lesson, bless everything that's said and done, and bless these people who have come out. For I ask these things in your name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Okay, we are going to talk the first time about resisting. Resisting the Holy Spirit. We're going to use Acts chapter 7. You all know what that's about. Acts chapter 7 is about Stephen. And if you were to to read chapter 6 before 7, you will find out that 
he was chosen. He, the, the two types of Jews, the Grecian Jews and the Hebrews, they were having some kind of conflict, and they was choosing out some men, and they picked out like seven men to go and, and preach the word, to pray and to read the word. And so they called these seven men, they laid hands on them, and they prayed that God would bless them. And it says that, that uh, in verse 7, or in chapter 7, somewhere, it's in, let's see, no, it's in verse, chapter 8. <laughs> Excuse me. It has not went right for three days, so you'll have to excuse my stumbling around here. Ver, uh, verse 8 of chapter 6, it says, And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. What he did was that he went out and he preached the truth. If you were to read that, you would know that he was talking or he was teaching all the way from Abraham all the way through to Christ and telling the people what God can do for them, what God did for Abraham, what God did for Joseph, what God did for Moses. And he was telling them all of these things. And they would not, would not receive it. In chapter 7, verse 51, I believe it is. Let me see if I can find it here. It says, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Spirit and your fathers, as your fathers did, so do ye. Now, you're all saying, I don't resist the Holy Spirit. I think we do and don't even realize it. How do, you re how do you resist the devil? Or how do you resist the Holy Spirit? Well, when the preacher is up here preaching and God begins to deal with you and he gives you a feeling that you should do something and you say, uh-uh. When he calls you to come down at the altar and you don't come, what do you call that? Resisting. When God lets the Holy Spirit begin to deal with you or speak to you, even, not even, maybe not in the church, but in your life, and you don't do it. What do you call that? Resisting. How many think it's resisting when you don't do that, or when you do that? How many has even thought about it called resisting? Not me. I always call it disobedience. But resisting is disobedience. When God tells you to do something, you need to do it. When he lets the Holy Spirit begin to speak to you, because that's what the Holy Spirit is supposed to do. The Holy Spirit is put down here for us, when Jesus left, to lead us and guide us and convict us. And that's what he does. And it says, you stiff-necked people. Let me tell you what the stiff-necked people... If you have a stiff neck, what happens? You can't turn. How many ever had a stiff neck? It's painful. You walk around and you, you're like this. You slept bad on the pillow and you straighten your head up and you can't do it. And he said you are a stiff necked people because you don't listen. You don't. Now we all know people who you have taught, that you have testified to, who you have prayed for. And they do not respond. They don't do it. Because stiff-necked people are stubbornness. They are stubborn and they, they don't want to do what they're supposed to do and they fight against. I, I was talking to my nephew and I began to talk to him about the Lord and he said, I have my own ideas. Doesn't mean it was right. I stopped right then. Well, why? Because he had already made up his mind what he believed. He'd already made up his mind what could happen. He already made up his mind. He didn't want to hear the good stuff. And this is what these people here was. They didn't want to hear what God could do. A lot of people who come to church come for different reasons, but they don't want to hear that God wants to change your life. That's why they go to churches who don't preach that. Because they don't want to hear what God requires of us to do. He causes us to change. And if you're stiff-necked, then you're stubborn, and you resist, and you fight, and you don't want to do it. 
And, and sometimes we do the same thing, when, especially if the Holy Spirit is telling us something that we don't want to do. Has God ever told you to do something you didn't want to do? And you all just smiled real great and just went and did it, didn't you? No. First of all, you said, why don't she go do it? Why don't you ask him to go do it? Why don't you do this? Because you are the one that God wanted to do it. But if you don't do it, he'll get somebody else who will do it. And so Stephen, when, he, when they came against him, they made up lies because he was telling the truth. And it said that God had blessed him with wisdom that they couldn't come against. And so if we have this in us, we can talk. But it doesn't mean that anybody or everybody is going to receive what you say. It just isn't going to happen. So we need to know that we offend the Holy Spirit. And this is not blasphemy, but it, it does offend the Holy Spirit because we don't do what we're supposed to do. When I didn't do what my mom told me to do, well, I did it the next time. Oh, yeah, you had one of those moms too, didn't you? Oh, yeah. They probably knew each other, gave each other ideas. I always thought my mom, her hand was like a, a wooden stick. There you go. We don't treat God that way. We, we know how, well, you know how you minded your parents. You know if you resisted what they said. I didn't. I did not resist what my mom said. I didn't have a father, so I had, I had my mom. And when she said, do it, you did it. When she said, jump, you said, how high, not why. When she told me to do it, and I have said this over and over and over, if I would obey God like I obeyed my mom, I would be one with a halo and wings. I would be so good, I would walk on water. But you see, my mom didn't have mercy. She didn't have patience. She had a board, a board of education. So we don't, we don't serve God like we served our parents because of mercy. These people did not want to change. And Stephen had told him and told him and told him. And finally he said, you're stiff-necked and you don't want to hear the truth. And so what they did, they caused told lies about him, and that's why he was stoned, because he would not quit talking about the Lord. He, God blessed him with wisdom, and he wanted everybody... What has God blessed you with that you want people to know about? Well, I'm going to tell you what you don't want to know. It's how you resist the devil. And you're saying back there, I, do I resist? Yes, we all do. We all do. But the problem is that we don't realize it offends the Holy Spirit. Well, maybe it's just me. Maybe I didn't realize it. I don't think we give it a second thought when we tell God no. I don't think we give it a second thought that when God tells us to do something, we have to stop and think it over. I don't think we give it a second thought because God is a God of goodness and grace. But we don't blaspheme him, and you know why? Because we believe, it says, if you do it, you're not going to make it to heaven. We believe that. So we don't go around and, and, and make up lies about him. We don't accuse him. We don't make fun at him. We don't do this because we believe that if we talk against him, if we blaspheme him, we won't make it to heaven. So we're not going to do that. But we will resist God. We will offend God. Why? Because that's forgivable. That's forgivable. So we need to know 
that we have a tendency to resist. And when we resist, we offend the Holy Spirit. The next one that we do, that we grieve the Holy Spirit. Now we all know, we've heard that so many times, you grieve the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians chapter 4, we read from 17 to 51, I think it is, the difference between the new life and the old life. And we grieve the Spirit when we don't obey God. Verse 17 says, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind. Having the understanding, having the understanding, darkness, being a net, a lion, a, a lion, somebody fill that in, I can't even pronounce it, alienated, that's it, from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Sometimes we grieve God by the blindness of our heart. Sometimes we slip back to what we used to do. And you say, I, I don't think we do. Listen, I know that it's true because I have been and then I have not been. I have been saved and then I have not been saved. You can't do it at the same time. Last week we talked about developing or growing the fruit. And how did we decide the fruit gets developed or grown? How does it grow? Everybody forget? Through the vine. The word. Through the vine. The closer you are in the vine or the branch to the vine, you're going to stay what you want to do. You're going to stay saved. I don't believe once saved, always saved, but I do believe that once saved, always can be saved. But I have been in the place when I got saved, and then I, I had a friend, and she stood up, and, and she went, you know, they all go their different ways when they turn 16 or 17. And, and she went to do her little old thing. And I stood up in church and I said, I think I'm not like so-and-so because she is long left. And, and, and I, you know, oh, I was just thanking God that he was so good to me and, and she was so awful to him. And, and guess what? That's right. Three years later, I was in the same place where that girl was, not near it with God. You have to stay in the vine to stay, uh, stay true to God. You have to stay in line with God so you don't grieve the Spirit. So it says, listen, since you know the darkness, you can stay away from it. But in verse 17, or in chapter 17, 4, sorry about that. In chapter 4 of Ephesians, verse, uh, let's see. 24, let's see, I got that mic down. I don't even know where I'm at here. It's been a bad day. Verse 30, chapter 4, verse 30 says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed by the day of redemption. Okay, if you're going to live by the rules of the Lord, you have to stay close to the vine. Now look at this. You said, I don't grieve the Spirit. Well, go down to verse 31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with malice. You say, I'm not bitter. Really? Maybe not now. Have you ever been bitter to somebody? 
You see, because we, we believe in, I forgive, but I don't forget. We have to forgive because, not because we desire to, but because if we don't, we don't deserve God's forgiveness. So that brings us back and says, I forgive you, I forgive you, but down deep in heart, we are still bitter by what happened. You say, ah, that grieves the spirit. He didn't put it in you, he takes it out of you. And I've had to pray. I've had to pray, Lord, you've got to get this bitterness from me. You've got to get this out of me. There was one time that I could not stand two ladies. I mean, I literally hated them. And I'm not telling you, just to, I'm telling you the truth. I would be sitting there and they could walk past me and I knew it was them. That's how much I disliked them. And it wasn't until I really gave my heart to the Lord that now I could say, I don't hate anybody. Oh, I don't hate anybody. But we don't like their actions. So you stay away from them. Well, what kind of testimony is that? What kind of testimony is that? You're bitter. You hate this thing. I hate the way they do it. I hate the way they do it. We carry bitterness in our heart unless we allow the Holy Spirit to take it from us. Then it says... And wrath, wrath, anger, rage. Now, y'all know that I've told you I had a temper. I still got a temper. God doesn't take my temper away, but I allow him to control it. And I have found out the more I stay in this, the less the rage falls into my, and out of my mouth, I should say. But you guys, do you have a temper? No, you, some of y'all are so meek and mild. I, I got the two boys that they just know how to handle things. And they, well, I get up there and I, ugh, they just sat and say, well, now, Mom, you got, I don't have to do that. I can be mad if I want to. <laughs> the fact is, I shouldn't be. And sometimes I say I'm mad when I am just irritated. You say Christians don't get irritated. Sure they do. Listen, you would not be you would not be human if you didn't do that. And if we didn't do it, it wouldn't be in here. That's what people do. They are bitter. They they carry grudges. I can remember that she did this to me way back then. Well then forget it. Well, I was mad then, and I'm mad now. It says, be angry and sin not. So I can be angry. And I take that to heart. (laughs) And I try not to sin. You see what I'm saying? We know the scriptures. But unless the Holy Spirit is within us and controlling them, we cannot control it. If we don't stick close to the one who gives us the power, which is the Holy Spirit, he's the one that does the work. God created Jesus. He saved But the Holy Spirit does the work. And when you pray, you pray to him. He goes to the Father. He goes to to God or Jesus. And Jesus goes to God. And God does the work, allows it to work. But it's the Holy Spirit that deals with us. And so you can say, I don't get bitter. I don't get mad. You do or it wouldn't be in here. A lot of people think, but I am just so holy. Well, I'm going to tell this about Chris. I don't know if he remembers this or not. But when he talks about how uh, the brother went way back behind, uh, in, underneath the stairs and asked him if he wanted to stay, uh, receive the Lord. Well, he was sitting way back, but I was sitting in the last pew. You remember that, Chris? I sat back here. Ah. I told him, the only thing that's holy about you is your clothes. (laughs) 
<laughs> Wasn't that nice of me? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Forgive us. <laughs> the whole point of this is that we grieve the spirit when we resist, when we and we resist it, but we don't think anything about it because that's us. But when we get saved, when we accept Christ who died on the cross, he, he got rid of the sin nature. He, he died. When we go and die with him, our sin nature should die. But the truth of the matter is, our sin nature is still in us. And these things still pop up. And I don't care how good you think you are, you're not. There's always room for improvement. I don't know what, what you need to improve. I know I need everything improved, but I don't know about you. And anger. Anger. Hostile. I know some Christians that has, is hostile to other people. I worked with a lady, and the people would come to me and say, if that's a Christian, I don't want to be. Isn't that something? But they go around and they think, I, I do this and, oh, the Lord does that. But listen, the anger, the hostility in them. And the, she said, I don't want, if that, Lord, if that's a Christian, I don't want to be. That was terrible. What are you going to say in a case like that? Because if we don't give all to the Lord, if we don't allow the Holy Spirit to reshape us, to mold us. We cannot get rid of these feelings. That's the fact. We cannot make ourselves good. We can't. We cannot change ourselves. Ladies, you can change the color of your hair, but you don't change the color of your hair. You have to dye it every six months. Let me tell you, if you change the color of your hair, it'd be done. My hair is changing, and I can't do anything about it. But when it gets that color, it's going to be that color, and it's going to be changed because I'm not going to have to dye it or bleach it or whatever. With us, we cannot change ourselves. We cannot get rid of these things because they are of sin nat nature. It is in us. The problem is, is if we allow it to come out. If we allow it to come out, that's like Jennifer just said, bite your tongue. And I think of my aunt so often because she said, she was talking to my mom, she said, Lisa, I just bit my tongue and bit my tongue, not to say that, but it came out anyway. And every time I opened my mouth, I said, Lord, I bit my tongue. I bit my tongue, but it came out anyway. You know why? Because the Holy Spirit is not at that moment in control of my life. He is the only one who can change your attitude, your actions, your, your uh, communications. He is the only one that can do that. How many of you know people who claim to be Christians that can cuss a blue streak? That tells me something is wrong somewhere. Because that should not be in you. I had a brother who could not speak unless he cussed. He just, I can't stand it. Just the other day, Patty was talking about something, and she said, I told whoever she's talking about that you had virgin ears because you didn't like to hear people. Listen, I don't want, if you got to cuss, don't come around me. If you got to drink, don't come around me. If you got to do these things, do it someplace else because I don't want it. I said a little boy, he was six years old. He was in, he was cussing and carrying on and my boys, they was only, I don't know, seven or eight, something like that. And I went out to that little kid and I said, I want to tell you something, young man. I don't talk that way. And if that's what you got to say, you can just go back on home. I'm never, that's the only kid I ever sent home. And he went home, and he didn't come back. Yet we sat and listened to people who verbalize, who's supposed to be a Christian, who says stuff like this. And we are just supposed to take it. That grieves the spirit. 
And when we just take it, I was told by one girl, as you all know, that, that the Lord, he told me to stop going to movies, so I don't go to movies. And she said, oh, Laurie, did you see such and such? And I said, no. And they all knew that I was a Christian, and she said, well, listen, it's really a good movie. I said, oh, really? Well, it, they do cuss in there a lot, but if you can... I said, why would I want to pay six, eight, ten dollars to go hear somebody cuss? Why would I want to do that? Well, it's a good show. Not if you have to go through all that garbage. I'm not going through the garbage to get a sandwich. I, I'm not doing that. God doesn't expect us to do that. He expects us to be like, like Stephen and profess what he is and tell how good he is and, and, and not grieve the Spirit. But we have a habit of grieving the Spirit. Why? Because sometimes we anger and clamorous. We're loud and, and, and boisterous and, and ridiculously. Ugh. We, hey, oh, I'm the, just so somebody can draw, so you can draw attention. God, you think that pleases God. That does not please God. It doesn't. The meek shall inherit what? The meek. It doesn't mean that you're, that you're not strong. It means that you humble yourself and, and you don't want this stuff. And I've told people, I had a... a, a a nephew was coming into my house, and, and we was kind of at odds. Well, he was at odds me. I was right. So he was at odds at me. And he comes into my house, and he says, I want to... And I said, I want to tell you one thing. You are welcome in this house, but only if you talk with a civil tongue in your mouth. I'm not having you come in there and create trouble. Well, they say, you can't do that. Why not? The, the Bible says that in order for somebody to overtake your house, they have to bind the, the people. They have to come in. You have to allow them. Why do we do this? Because we are stuck with these things, and we are no Stevens. You say, Lord, that's terrible. I know it is. And I had a terrible time with this. I sat down and, and prayed, Lord, all of these things... You've got to cleanse them for me. You say, you got all those things? Probably. Probably not all at once. But they're probably in there. And so we got to behave ourselves. Loud. We don't want advance. Evil speaking, cussing, cursing, talking bad about people. You know, there's, there's a lot of things that go under these things that we do just automatically, that we do not even think that we are grieving the Spirit. Because when we do this, the Spirit cannot do His work. He is to help us live a life of righteousness. That when we're in this like this, we have no righteous, good or bad. I told Patty one day, I'm, I'm, I'm mad about this. And she said, well, I think it's holy righteousness. I don't. I think it's just anger. I mean, let's call it what it is. You might say, well, it's holy righteousness. No, it's just I'm mad. I'm irritated. I don't like what I see. I don't like what's happening to me. I don't like it. There's nothing holy about it. I am not righteous. I'm angry. I'm angry and I sin not. Because there's so many times I have to go to the Lord and say, Lord, help me. Help me to forget what has been said. Help me to forget what has been done. Help me to forget. And if it's not God that helps me, it would be all inside. And I would be a worse person than I am already. And I really think I'm pretty good, but who knows. Anyway, it says, with all malice, malice. I'm 
I know. With all malice, desire to hurt. You see, we, we do all these things to hurt. To hurt. And, and we should be like a doctor, which, which they take this oath. And the first thing is what? To do no harm. And we as Christians should have that as our model. First of all, we should be like Peter and go and say, such as silver and gold have I not, such as I have, give I thee. And then we should be like a doctor and first do no harm. Because if you're going to talk to these people who's resisting, they don't want to hear how good God is. They don't want to hear but if you will talk to them and let them know, give them your testimony, like Chris always says, give them to your testimony and let them know what he did for you. And if they know you, they'll know it. If they know you, they will know how your life has changed. And they go, you, you cannot just say, I am a Christian. You cannot just wear clothes that says, she is a Christian. You cannot have a thing on your car of a face or a cross or whatever saying, you know, stay behind me because I have the Lord co-pilot. Have you ever seen that? God is my co-pilot. I said, God, shouldn't I be a co-pilot? He should be your pilot. That doesn't make you a Christian. What makes you a Christian is how you act and what you say. And that is the Holy Spirit. Because that's what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit helps us to be able to make it to the end. The Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, we can do nothing. For the Holy Spirit is God's mark of our ownership of you. A guarantee that the day will come when God will set you free. Free, not only from your sin, but free to be with him. It's through the Holy Spirit and nobody else. It's the Holy Spirit that does these things. And be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as Christ, for, uh, for as even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. We all remember that. We all know that's true. But we all sometimes fail to do it. We fail the Holy Spirit. We fail God, not because we don't know. It's because we don't consider it wrong at the time. When, I don't be, when I'm not obedient to God, I know it's wrong. But I don't know it's wrong enough for me to change. Until I get into a spot where God says, this is what you would need to do. I want to tell you, I never used to pray for little things. I used to have little problems. And I'd say, okay, God, you don't have to worry about this because I can do it. I can do it. You don't have to worry. I can do it, God. You don't have to worry. Don't worry about it. I can do it, God. Just don't worry about it. And before you know it, my little problem has become a big problem. Whereas when I look, when I look back and thought, if I would listen to God from the beginning, I wouldn't be in the spot now. That's what happens to stiff-necked people. You have to show them or they have to learn. Eventually, your neck begins to loosen up and you can turn your head. Eventually, if the Lord allows the Holy Spirit to speak to them. You see, we came because the Spirit began to convict us. We didn't know we were sinners until the Lord said, Go get them. Go get Laura. Tell her she's bad. Me? I'm bad. I read the cross and the, and, and the switchblade, and I wasn't as bad as that. I'm not bad. 
But you see, our actions that we seem to forget does not send us to hell. What sends us to hell is not knowing Christ. And that's what the stiff-necked people need to know. And grieving the Spirit does not keep us from serving God. It keeps us sometimes from getting blessed from God. So we need to take these to heart. Resisting and grieving. Two that are not blasphemy, but still are offenses of the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't know about you what you're going to get out of this, but I have woke up and I said, okay, Lord, help me. Help me to know that when I begin to do these things, that you will touch me and say, listen, no more, Lord. And you have to help me. And like I say, I've already prayed. God, I know I got most all of that. I, I don't call them that, but I've got them. And so I need for you to take them from me because that's the only one who can. Otherwise, we will grieve the Spirit all the time because it's through Him that we make it to heaven. It is the Holy Spirit that, does us, that draws us to the Lord. It is the Holy Spirit that keeps us close to Him. And it is the Holy Spirit that helps us to live the righteous life and to be able to make it to our permanent place that we desire to be. It's all with the Holy Spirit and nothing else. Let's stand. Father God, I thank you for your word. I thank you that the Holy Spirit cares enough for all of us to correct us. Because we know your word says that if you cannot correct us, we cannot be one of yours. And I pray, God, that we would take this serious of resisting the Holy Spirit and serious about quenching the Spirit. And I pray, God, that when we do this, that you will quicken us, that we will know that we are doing harm not only to ourselves but to the Holy Spirit. I pray, God, that as we have studied these things, that you would bring back to our remembrance of how we should be and bring back to our remembrance that how close we should be get to Jesus and never be satisfied, always wanting to get closer. Let the Holy Spirit do his job in each and every one of us that's here. And, Father, if we have any of these things that would grieve the Spirit, I pray that we would be cleansed of it, even as today. I thank you, Lord, for each and every one. I thank you for your word. And I pray, God, that you would be uh, with us in our following service. Bless the speaker. Bless the singing and song service. And, Lord, let the Holy Spirit do his job and cause us to have a mighty, mighty service. For I ask these things in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen.